blessings and welcome everyone nico here and the following video is another lecture taken from the patreon live series that i've been doing where i help to develop foundational approaches and essential courses on adapting and advancing our work with various tools and various corners of the realm of applied metaphysical arts and applied spiritual arts this video is all about working with plants herbs plant energy how they actually work when it comes to manifestation your spiritual practice workings as well as what we can do to help harness those energies in our own workings with our own path and how to develop a strong foundational approach to working with plants assessing plants getting an intimate understanding of their place in this entire experience in this entire spiritual realm and spiritual process at the end i also give you a list of herbs that you most likely have in your spice rack that you can use and apply to your magic right away if you are interested in taking part in any of these lives because they are longer the original talk with this particular lecture went on about an hour and 20 minutes uh, including a q a you can of course sign up on my patreon by following the links in the down bar below and do not forget of course i have included chapters and timestamps for your navigational convenience and without further ado let's get on to the lecture welcome 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 everybody i hope you are all doing very very well in today's live we are going to be talking about herbs and plants and really helping you to set a strong foundation when it comes to working with plants working with herb magic working with plant energies in general now as this is a foundational course i do want to remind folks that this is going to be a blend of intermediate and beginner content and so there is going to be something for everybody whether you have been practicing for some time or you are just getting started i'm going to basically help you build to be able to analyze and assess essentially the energies of every single plant um, and how you can actually use that right help to assess the circumstances around the energies you are playing with and what comes forward through there and how that all kind of plays out i do of course want to give the proprietary warnings about making sure that you are applying common sense, researching things such as toxicity, not only to yourself, but also, you know, your dogs and your cats, keeping careful when it comes to your own allergies, right? Knowing yourself and taking, you know, of course, responsibility and all precautions necessary. There are certain herbs and certain oils that are sold and are very commonplace that can be very toxic to both humans and animals. Uh, cedar, for instance, as well as lemongrass, they are both very common uh, in oil and in dry form, but they are very toxic to cats and they are very toxic to dogs as well. And you want to make sure you are not applying or feeding or making available for feeding any of these tools to your animals. So when it comes to working with plants, um, there are a lot of questions that can often come up because it's kind of, when you look at the world of contemporary spiritual practice, plants themselves tend to not necessarily confuse people, but a lot of people may attempt to try and use plant work or plant magic or plant energy, herbal energy, the way that they would go about working with a crystal. And the truth of the matter is, is that plant vibrations and crystal vibrations work very, very differently. And so we don't want to necessarily treat them as though they are one and the same. They work very, very well together. But plants themselves actually have a completely different function in the way that they work alchemically. Now, when it comes to why work with plants, why work with herbs in general, very much like crystals, they do hold their own unique vibration. They hold their own unique spiritual constituents that actually resonate to certain experiences and certain creations that we may want to, of course, bring into our space or changes we want to create in our space. 
I like working with plants and herbs uh, the most. Honestly, I've you know started working with plants and herbs before anything else is because the reason I like doing it that way, or the reason I like them so much, I should say, is because plants ultimately at the end of the day have a much more interesting relationship with the world as it is. They, like us, are consciousness made manifest, right? Consciousness brought into the physical and are actually results of consciousness that has physicalized and taken on a specific experience all within itself. Plants carry vibrational foundations, or you can say plants uh, carry foundational energies for foundational experiences and foundational work. When we look at working with a crystal, okay, we'll use a plant versus crystal type of example. Crystals take energy in, they hold energy and intention, and they amplify it. When we put energy into plants or we call forth energy through plants, it's kind of like pushing light through a color gel for anyone who has any kind of um, experience in, say, theater or, or film, right? If you put up a color gel in front of a light, you can turn a white light blue or a white light yellow or a white light pink. So plants actually filter the energy we put through it and actually allow that energy to take on its own quality. It helps us to stabilize our intentions to become more clear and more specific. As we said in the crystal video, right? The more crystal clear and coherent our intentions, the more successful our process is, the more successful our manifestations are, the more successful our readings are and our spiritual communications are. If it's incoherent, if it's disorganized, if it's all over the place, it's not going to actually produce a result that may be of very high quality. Plants assist us with further articulating and giving foundation to our works and our workings, while also, yes, some plants also amplifying and boosting them. Plants themselves are not as fluid as crystals. You know, when you look at, say, uh, a quartz or you look at a rose quartz, you might see a ream <laughs> of all kinds of different uses and all kinds of different applications. Plant energy is not so much the same. Remember, this is something that has taken on a life of its own that will help us with very specific tasks and go about it in very specific ways. Plants themselves do work faster than crystals when it comes to any kind of spiritual working or spiritual practice. However, plants themselves do not retain or uh, continue to absorb energy in that way. So their effect doesn't last quite as long. So, you know, it's always good to work with these things in according to, you know, in accordance with what you are trying to do, what you need it for. If you need something that's going to come on slowly or come on more gradually or hold its vibration for a long time, yeah, crystals are definitely going to be helpful. If you want to precipitate shifts more quickly or you want something to hit a little bit faster or hit with a bit more intensity, herbs and plants are going to assist your magic and your alchemy better in that way. However, of course, you know, any kind of proficient practitioner is going to know you want to work with what works and you're going to want to, of course, mix and match because, you know, you want things to be fluid, you want things to be stable, and you want things to be effective. And so it's not about is is it better to work with plants or is it better to work with crystals? It's about, all right, what is right for what job? Plants offer their essence. Remember, they are bringing their essence into this reality experience. So essence is everything. When it go comes to assessing whether or not a certain herbal correspondence or spiritual correspondence is appropriate to your intention, what you're trying to create, what you're trying to manifest, you have to understand the essence of the tool or the essence of the plant you are working with. And it's good to develop a practice and a strategy for knowing how to do that, right? Now we're going into not only looking at the forest for the trees, 
but we're looking at the forest for its nature. We are looking at the forest and the trees themselves for their natural essence. And so you have to be capable of going deep and thinking deeply. Maybe you find a, a table of correspondences or a, a list of plants or herbs or flowers that all resonate to a particular intention or desire, let's say healing or wealth or protection. They're all going to go about doing it their own unique way. So you may know or find that yes, cinnamon does resonate with wealth and with money and, and all of that. And so does cedar, but they're going to go about it in very different ways. We can ascertain the differences between these ways about going about manifesting a certain intention by then, of course, assessing the nature of the plant or assessing the nature of the herb. A school of thought that I think really can serve in this effort is the doctrine of signatures, wherein, uh, you know, just to put it in a very basic way, a plant's nature, what a plant does on the physical is what a plant does on the spiritual. It's not everything. It's not everything, but it's a good start. It's a good platform. And of course, we already know as above, so below, as within, so without. So taking, for instance, the discussion of cinnamon and cedar manifesting wealth or mint, you know, or any uh, other example of a plant that resonates with wealth and with money and abundance and all of that. Cedar, in its essence, is a very stable, long-living tree. And it is very hardy. It's evergreen. It's a conifer. And so we can see it manifesting wealth, but we can also understand that this is about wealth retention, maybe even uh, stability, financial security, anything where we want something to set a precedent to be held. It is manifesting abundance and wealth, but it may not necessarily be focusing so much at, on rapid acquisition, so much as it is focusing on stability, security, stores, comfort, and reserves. And that can, of course, be very important, right, to maintain that security, to maintain that longevity, whether it's at a job or just, you know, with the commodity of money, with money in general. When it comes to, say, cinnamon or mint, we've got a very different kind of expression. Cinnamon is a very attractive scent. It also vibrates to love very much. Cinnamon itself also has a bit of a bite to it, and so it can often be used for protection. It's one of those very nice multi-purpose types of herbs. Cinnamon works quickly because there is the fire, there is the energy, there is the passion, and then there is the driving element behind it. And whenever you work with cinnamon, it's pretty much the first thing you smell or it's the first thing you taste or it's one of the first things you taste. So it brings its energy up quickly. Therefore, cinnamon manifests money faster than, say, cedar would. Cedar will hold on to that money for longer than cinnamon will. So you have an attractant and then you have something that is a preserver great in combination with one another and something that's going to make your money magic or your money workings work all the more effectively. Mint is an accelerant. Mint grows very, very quickly. If you've ever tried to grow mint without having some kind of containment in your garden, you know it's going to take over everything. Mint itself also is one of those herbs that brings its scent and its flavor right to the front. And it is also very, very attractive. It's very, very clean. Mint is also very good for healing and for cleansing. And so mint, you can add to anything in order to speed up its workings. Now, a combination of cinnamon, cedar, and mint would make a very balanced financial spell or a very balanced economy spell because you've got the attractant of cinnamon, the stability of cedar, and the speed of mint all working together with you. When we look at working with plants, we want to use the same philosophy and the same method of analysis with everything. If you're working with protection works, you're trying to protect your energy, a lot of plants vibrate to protection. Cedar is also really good for protection, but so could one say cayenne pepper 
or clove or black pepper or mustard. And when we think about, say, cayenne pepper or we think about mustard, they don't operate necessarily the same way. They don't retain protection in terms of fortification. They protect through repellent. In this case, you would say cedar or the Douglas fir or the cinnamon itself could even be seen as more of a shield, whereas a repellent such as cayenne pepper, right, that burns, that's going to be more of like the sword or the brambles around the wall. And ginger can operate in either way, depending on how much ginger you use. Taking a second to look and see how your plants are operating or how plants naturally operate is going to make you a better practitioner when it comes to working with plant energies. Because essence is everything, you also want to pay attention to what works with you. We are not compatible energetically with everything on the planet all the time. We have an essence, they have an essence. Certain people at certain times of their lives will, of course, go through these phases where they vibrate really, really strongly with certain plants or certain herbs, and sometimes they don't. How well your working is going to perform depends on how well you work with your herbs. And we ultimately have an understanding of ourselves when we know what we're compatible with. And the more we work with that which we are truly compatible with, the stronger our results are going to be. So you might already have an idea of what herbs and what tools you are already compatible with. And when you play with that, you make friends with them. One of the other things you might want to look at when it comes to doing your works is what is the nature of the very plant or the genus you are playing with, right? Chemical components are vibrational components. A good way to look at it, if something is a, you know, evergreen, right? A conifer type of plant, you can pretty much guarantee that that work or that energy is going to be held. It's going to be fixed. It's going to have some great longevity. If it's deciduous or it's an annual, then it's most likely something that's going to work very, very quickly. And then it's going to stop working once it's done its job or once it has fulfilled its purpose. When we play with herbs in this way, and we, you know, instead of looking at them as tools, we look at them as elements, right? Components of our spiritual experience, we become more proficient with them. When we work with plants as well, it's important to understand that they immediately go to work for us. And whether you are working for them, uh, whether you are working with them in dry form, liquid form, or smoke form, distilled form, that's going to change a little bit about how they go to work for us. If you are working with an oil, okay, so a plant oil, so an essential oil or something like that, or even an extract such as a tincture, what's going to happen is, is as that oil or as that tincture evaporates, the energy of that plant is getting propelled to go very, very quickly, to go to work very, very quickly. This is why this is commonly used to anoint the self, right? When you anoint yourself with different oil blends, of course, diluted, or you might um, anoint yourself with a tincture, or you may imbibe a tincture. It's so that you can actually take on the essence and the energy of that plant within your energy field so that you are carrying it with you and it goes to work right away. When it comes to working with dry materials, dry materials are going to, of course, hold their intention better because they're not evaporating and they're not necessarily in a state of rapid decay. But you are going to want to, of course, assign them a job, <laughs> assign them something to do. One of the biggest mistakes I think a lot of people can make is that they kind of treat crystal magic or crystal workings or herb magic or herb workings or even candle magic um, almost the way they would treat a microwave. It's not like Hollywood where you just grab a bunch of stuff together and then it's just going to automatically go to work for you. You are the most powerful being in the work. You are divine creator incarnate. You are the one that is making it happen. Charging the herbs so that they can further specify and solidify your intention and empower it in a much more specific and crystal way 
is going to be the difference between success or failure. Same thing with working with stones. Plants are not as fluid in their usage universally, so pay attention to the fact that their energies are fixed, okay? When you're doing things like substitutions or maybe you are looking to achieve a certain end, you want to make sure that you are being very smart about why you are choosing the plant you are choosing. Going back to what we were talking about before with understanding that each plant is gonna kind of take a different road to achieve a certain end, even if they are set or resonant with the same end. There are very few all-purpose plants. There are certain plants out there that cover a multitude of different intentions and vibrate to a multitude of different intentions, such as cinnamon, but all-purpose plants themselves are best used as supplements to workings as they are not always reliable substitutes for specific uses spiritually, okay? When it comes to how you apply the herb, how you go about putting it to work for yourself, that really all depends on your personal style. So if you are, you know, maybe going to use the herb in, in its dry form to maybe uh, sprinkle on perhaps a candle that you have anointed with uh, olive oil or some kind of condition oil, or maybe you are looking to simply create a mojo or a bottle. You guys have seen, I have tons of, you know, herb bottles and intention bottles and spell bottles. They're in a lot of my pictures. However you want to apply it, of course, that depends on what you are doing. You know, how is it that you want this to go to work? Are you trying to magnetize something to you? Are you trying to attract something into your life or create a situation to hold in your life? Then you may want something that's going to stick around. So a bottle, a box, a container, mojo, medicine bag, of course, is going to make the most sense there. Are you sending something away? Are you clearing something out? Okay, well, maybe, you know, throwing the herbs themselves into a bonfire or a fireplace, or again, maybe using them in conjunction with some kind of candle magic or burning them themselves or burning them in the form of incense may be ideal. If you are looking to set up a perimeter or to make a shift in your space when it comes to your home, you know, sprinkling them around the outside of, the, of your house, or maybe making a potpourri dish and putting it in the putting those dishes in the four corners of your space up and away so they're not handled or disturbed in any way the possibilities are not quite endless but nearly endless and so it really all depends on how much of an imagination you want to employ when it comes to your practice and of course never forget if it is something that's edible and safe to eat you can always create yourself you know, something to eat, something to ingest, something to imbibe, right? Whether it's, you know, a tincture or a cake or a special dish or a stew or a bath for you to lay in, for you to soak up that energy with. Spiritual baths are a huge deal. I do plan on coming back and talking about concoctions and potions and creations and all of that in December. So don't rush me. We'll get there. They do need to be directed towards a particular intention or towards a particular desire. Now, I do have, again, videos about how to charge and bless things. And so um, I will leave a link here for everybody as well. Um, or you can also use the same method that I was already talking about in the crystal video from before. But the application of your energy to charge and wake up is very simple. You focus on your intention raise energy, direct that energy into the plant, and you hold that, right? You call forth not only that energy to go into the plant, but the visualization, the intention, the desire. If you can't visualize, speak out loud. If you want to, of course, write it down physically and then charge the plant and what you've written down together, whether it's in the same bowl or in the same bag or on the same candle, however it goes, that is perfectly fine. But you do need to, of course, give direction, right? Practice setting and directing your intentions. In the Q&A, somebody did 
want to talk about the difference between working with basil and, uh, you know, and uh, in, in dry form versus essential oil form. And I really do want to uh, talk a little bit about why you might notice some differences uh, when it comes to working with dry herbs versus maybe liquid form. When an essential oil is created, not all of the components of that plant are actually going into the essential oil itself, right? We are distilling it, We are whether it's through steam distillation or there may be some kind of solvent extraction going on. And just by, the, by virtue of the fact that there is an extraction occurring, not all molecular components of the plant are getting into the final product. And the same can also occur in incenses where there may be less usage of dry herbs and more of a soaking in essential oils. Now, that does not necessarily mean anything positive or negative. It's a completely neutral circumstance. It's a neutral occurrence. If you find that you are guided to work with something dry and more whole and complete versus an essential extraction, then that obviously means that there is something in the dry herb that you are being guided to work with that does not show up in the final extraction. And so there could be, you know, some chemical components that are really, really important there. Speaking of chemical components, another way you can go about assessing how an herb might work for you is to help yourself become more familiar with certain chemical components. One of the most interesting things I discovered, um, this was way back in the day, this was like 2008, 2009, I was working on a project where I wanted to actually create almost a table of correspondences based on chemical components of plants versus the plants themselves. I never got done with it because it was too monumental a task. I was looking at how different cultures around the planet all arrived at very similar uses and understandings of the vibrations of plants, even if those cultures didn't necessarily meet. And I noticed that the common thread between a lot of these plants, going back to the doctrine of signatures, was actually in their main chemical components that were going to work. For instance, when it comes to any kind of attractant, a plant that would be maybe considered useful for love, romance, or uh, sex, and all of that, linalool was a chief chemical component. And so linalool itself, naturally occurring, uh, was holding that vibration. And of course, that is why a lot of people ended up associating things universally, such as jasmine or rose, or violet with love. And if you've ever taken a look at the chemical components of their essential oils, linalool is one of the primary, if not the primary component. When we think about any kind of herb that is used as a, a cleanser or a repellent or something that is going to have more of an astringent quality that'll help clean and purify your space, such as sage or such as eucalyptus, then we can actually see eugenol being the primary component or one of the strongest or most concentrated chemicals in that plant, which is why in a lot of cases and in a lot of cultures, they kind of arrived at the same conclusion. Eugenol is also present in rosemary as well as even in clove. And so when you think about how that kind of universally across the globe seemed to assist all of these cultures with arriving at the same understanding, it's actually quite interesting. But now I'm going to nerd out all about herbs and chemical components and spiritual atomic structures. And so I'm going to take a step back because this is just a part one class. Another thing that you want to pay attention to when it comes to putting your herbs to work is that when you are charging, when you are imparting your intention, understand that you want to choose an intention and an herb that are already a match. Do not attempt to make something that is not a vibrational match be the vessel and the conduit and the support system for something that is not its match, right? That's common sense. We wouldn't want to do that in, say, friendships or jobs or relationships. Well, we don't want to do that when it comes to our plants. So I wanted to close up with a discussion of magic in the spice rack 
or giving you a bit of a rundown of some of the spiritual correspondences of plants and herbs that you already hold on to, that you already have in your kitchen and where you can already start playing with this. So big one. And again, it's one of my favorites. We already talked about this. Nutmeg is one of the most powerful herbs when for when it comes to actually helping you to part and clear veils around yourself, opening up your psychic senses, when it comes to allowing yourself to establish and bridge safe contact spiritually, whether it's safe contact with your guides, your higher self, or any kind of beings that you are on, loving, supportive, compatible, complementary terms with, because it does also work as a bit of a psychic protector. It opens you up. It's great for divination. It's great for readings, burning nutmeg incense while you're reading tarot cards, or maybe you are in a meditation session, or you are looking to go to sleep and maybe induce um, an out-of-body experience, lucid dreaming. Nutmeg is a great wish booster as well, because while nutmeg does tend to focus a lot more on the astral and the non-physical, it also helps you to physicalize things that you're already creating on the non-physical, whether these are things you are working on in your meditations, when you are actually doing your work of creating something on the non-physical or in the etheric in order to physicalize it down here, so to speak. Nutmeg is also really, really good for allowing your own uh, energy bodies to transcend any blockages that may be occurring when it comes to spiritual development, when it comes to mastering the application of metaphysical arts. You know, is there something that you're trying to activate that you already know you can do, but you're trying to get it under control? It's been very helpful in a lot of cases, even for myself, to make something that was more of a wild power, more of a disciplined and consistent power. Anise, star anise, is also very good for psychic development, and it's also very good for spiritual contact and holding open spiritual channels. And it is also really, really good for helping to boost any kind of the clairs that you are working with, clairaudience, clairsentience, claircognizance, uh, clairvoyance, because star anise is also going to assist with clearing away any kind of density or purging away anything that could be interfering with spiritual communications or the applications of psychic gifts. It's also a wonderful, wonderful herb for being able to make sure that a line of spiritual or psychic connection or psychic communication stays clear, which is very important. And just one thing for those of you who are interested in using it this way or practicing any kind of divinatory arts in general, whether it is mediumship, spiritual contact, or even tarot or astrology, remember to set your intentions there as well. Cinnamon, also mentioned that a little bit earlier. I guess I kind of gave myself some spoilers. Cinnamon is great for protection because not only is cinnamon a wood, yes, it's a wood for some people who might not know, uh, so it does also establish a very strong, very you know safe and secure shield, but it also has a bit of that bite to it, and so it can also work as a protectant and a repellent at the same time. In my own experience working with cinnamon, I find that cinnamon still makes a better shield than maybe a sword or a bramble, but at the same time, it does assist with holding a stronger protection around yourself and around your space, as opposed to maybe something that would chase off negativity, but not reestablish a boundary. Cinnamon is great for that. Cinnamon is also fantastic as an attractant for both wealth and for love because cinnamon holds an energy frequency that is very appealing. It works as a magnet for these things. And so it's usually wealth in the form of favor or in the form of uh, affection or support. And so when we see this, this is where we're currying favor in interviews and meetings. We're becoming a bit more popular, a bit more well-known, and we are also drawing in those that want what we are putting on the table, right? It helps us to attract that which is a compatible match, either for love or for friendship or for business. Rosemary 
is also an herb very much like cinnamon that covers a huge swath of intentions. It's a very complex herb, and it is also a very supportive herb. I look at this as kind of the um, white candle or the clear quartz of any kind of attractant or positive magic or positive workings. It's very good for cleansing. It's very good for healing. It does make for decent protection, though I don't necessarily recommend using rosemary all by itself for spiritual protection because rosemary protects by being a filter, but not necessarily a boundary. And so while it will protect, it might not necessarily be something to use all on its lonesome. Rosemary is also wonderful for restoration of any kind of lost energy. If you've been dealing with situations where you've been getting drained or you've exhausted yourself or you just kind of feel deflated, rosemary is really good for helping to fill out your energy field and also feed energy into any kind of workings that resonate with rosemary anyway, right? Feeding love works, feeding healing works, feeling, uh, feeding cleansing works, anything where there does need to be more substance there, right? The more energy, the, the stronger the charge, the more effective it is. Ginger, very strong protective herb. Ginger is used in a lot of traditional protective oils, uh, you know, and for those of you that have maybe been exploring spiritual protection and things like that, ginger is used in a lot of, say, fiery wall of protection oils, which is a commonplace recipe, or just any kind of works where there does need to also be a bit of a repellent type of nature to the working. So it's not just uh, putting up a boundary, but it's also putting up a boundary and repelling discord, repelling negativity, repelling that which is not wanted. Ginger is used in a lot of return to sender work or reversal work in that respect as well. But ginger is also really good for favoring that we, we want to keep. Ginger also arouses a lot of passion. It's a very um, Mars-like herb. And so it can also bring a lot of that driving force into more personal exchanges as well. Mustard, dry mustard, yellow or black, excellent for spiritual protection as well. It also works in reversal work, and it also works as a repellent. So whether you are kicking something out, sending something back, or just preserving your space, mustard is also very, very strong. Clove, we already talked about that a bit. One of my favorites, if not my absolute favorite scent, if I could, you know, let you know that. <laughs> there you go. Clove covers the gambit when it comes to anything where you are looking to become a stronger presence or strengthen the power of any of your intentions that you're putting forward. It is a very strong protector. It is also a strong repellent, especially when it comes to reversal and re return to sender work. And it's also a very strong amplifier of wealth and love and passion workings, especially when it comes to strengthening things that are already there. So you have something that is here and you want it to expand, you want it to grow, you want it to become more prominent, you want it to become more of a force. That is what clove does. And so it is good for, of course, helping and enhancing the quality of life for things that you're working with. I find that clove itself is not necessarily bad for manifestation, but it tends to work better on things that you already have or things you already want to get rid of. And finally, we have mint. So mint in and of itself is all about speed. Kind of like when I talk about Mercury in astrology, the planet of communications, haste, and speed. Mint very much carries this energy. I always add mint to things that I want to carry out quickly, and I want to cast a wide net. Because what mint does is not only does it work as an accelerant, but it actually allows an influence or allows an intention to carry farther, not just faster. Mint is wonderful for any kind of wealth workings or money workings, or if you are trying to speed up something that's been a bit sluggish, you want to open up lines of communication. It's a wonderful communication tool, and it's a wonderful way to even start initiating new connections socially, personally, professionally. And it's also a really strong healer. 
albeit with mint, we see a bit more of that rosemary-like tendency to quickly draw in restorative energy to fill any cracks, fill any holes, you know, really seal things up, get things back to their best. And so you could use mint and rosemary together for a bit of a very strong cleansing energy boost really feed that energy into yourself. You know, um, a rosemary mint bath might be a bit tingly. So maybe you want to steep the herbs as opposed to using rosemary and mint in drops in the bath itself. Again, apply common sense. But that would also be a, a great thing you could do for yourself. The applications of a lot of these herbs themselves are readily available online. And so I will be coming back with my suggestions for how to maybe go about choosing the best application for the best intention in part two. But I feel like this is something that ultimately is going to at least give you the foundation for how to take an approach, how to actually confront this process and confront this practice so you can have the best practice possible. If you do have any questions, of course, let me know. Um, but we are going to now break for the Q&A.